Revelation chapter 18, and I'm going to just jump right in. We've got a lot of ground uh, to cover here. Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. After these things. What are these things? Well, these things is referring to the outpouring of the seventh bowl of God's wrath, uh, which began in Revelation chapter 16. And at that time, God declared, it is done. And there, in, with that, it is done. Listen, no more opportunities to repent, no more delays, no more grace. See, God is a God of love. God loves you desperately. He loves you so much, he gave his only begotten son to die for you on the cross in your place. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. And so... Even with the tribulation period, when God takes his church out and begins to pour his wrath out on an unrepentant world, with every judgment of God, there are also opportunities for repentance. And so we have seen God pouring out his judgment in the seven seal judgments and in the seven trumpet judgments. And uh, through the six first bowls of wrath that are poured out. And with every judgment and with every outpouring of his wrath, it's accompanied with uh, his grace that is, that is extended to us, that there is an opportunity to repent. There is an opportunity to turn to, to Christ. And so probably during the tribulation period, it will be the greatest evangelistic period of time that the world has ever known. So that even though God has taken his church out, there is still the outworking of his wrath because God desires to save sinners. And so that all is going to be taking place. But listen, by the time it gets to the seventh bowl of wrath, that's when God says, look, it's all done. My grace is all done. And now it's, it's just about wrath. It's just about judgment. <clears throat> and here now in Revelation chapter 18, what we have is the consummation of the warnings that have been going out throughout the Bible, throughout history since the fall of mankind. God's ongoing warning to us to come out from among them and be separate. Not to be deceived or enticed by the riches of the world or by the lust of the flesh. Not to allow anything to, become, to come between us and the Lord. Between us and Jesus. To, not to let the cares and the concerns of this world and the things of this world that they would choke out uh, the word of God and make us unfruitful. And, and so because the inhabitants of the world at this point in time, with the seventh uh, bowl of God's wrath being poured out, because they've totally rejected these warnings, God's judgment now will be complete. It will be total against the government of Antichrist. And we saw last week this government of Babylon, it's comprised of three distinct components. That there is spiritual component of Babylon. There's a political component of Babylon. And there is an economic component of Babylon. Last week in chapter 17, we focused on the destruction of spiritual Babylon. And continuing with that destruction now in, verse, or in chapter 18, the focus is on the destruction of political and economic Babylon. And so we read, after these things, well, John says, I saw another angel coming from heaven. Now, this text talks about how it's a powerful angel, and there are those that liken this angel to Jesus, and they say this is Jesus who comes down. Probably not, because when he says another angel, that word another means literally another of the same kind. And so what that tells us is that the angel that came down in, in Revelation 17, this is the, it's another angel like that that is being spoken of. Verse 2, and he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. You'll notice, first of all, that the phrase is fallen is repeated twice here. That's not a typo. That's a, a, an idea, a reference to spiritual Babylon has fallen, chapter 17. And now it's followed by political and economic Babylon falling. So is fallen, is fallen. Um, and we see all three of these depicted 
in, there in verse 3. It says in verse 3, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, speaking of spiritual Babylon. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, speaking of political Babylon. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And there we have economic Babylon reflected. And the angel declares of them all, look, the whole system. Every last part of Babylon, through and through, is demonic, saturated with demons. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Maybe if you're given to notes, you might want to circle that word reached. Nearby, you could write heaped up. It's actually a play on words here. Uh, in the Greek, the, uh, the, the attitude is the, this, this word reached to heaven. It, it carries with it the idea of something that, that is built together or glued together. And, and you'll recall there at the, you know, Babylon, at the, at the beginning of Babylon, started with the Tower of Babel, man's first concerted effort at organized religion, a way that, that they could circumvent God and independently of God reach the heavens. Uh, and, and so what happened there is they made this effort to reach the heavens apart from God, and God tells us here, look, here's what reached heaven. It wasn't, it wasn't your tower, <laughs> well, it was, in a sense, it was your sins that have reached heaven. You wanted to circumvent God and reach heaven. Well, guess what? Your sins reached heaven is what happened here. And take note there in verse 5, God says that he has remembered her iniquities. That's important. See, one of the greatest blessings that you and I enjoy as Christians is that God doesn't remember our sins. Right? That, that, that God chooses to forget our sins. The Bible says that, you know, God says, I will be their God and they shall be my people, for I will be merciful to their unrighteous and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Uh, Micah chapter 7, verse 19 God will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. He will cast all of our sins into the depths. Of the sea. I love what Corey Tamboom said in regards to that verse. She said, God has taken our sin, He's thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness, and He's posted a sign that says, No fishing allowed. See, Satan goes fishing. Satan, he is the, the accuser of the brethren. Satan is the one who stands at the door of your heart and pounds on it and says, you are a blow it. You're a sinner. You, you can't go to God. What do you think? You think you're going to be able to go to God? Let me just rattle off the sins here. And you got to know, man, Satan will lie and say, God's keeping track. He's keeping track of all your sins, and you got a lot to overcome. you got a lot to make up. you got a lot to, to, to appease to get right with God. See, I'll meet people from time to time who, you know, having invited them to church, they have the attitude that says, well, you know, before I go to church, i got to clean up my life a little bit. I can't go yet because, you know, God's, i got a rap sheet that's pretty long, and i got some atoning to do before I can go and, and you know, go to church, I mean, I'll get hit by lightning if I go to church, man. And, and, and the thing is, Satan would love for you to just live in that place, to feel like, look, you in your relationship with God and you're relating to God, that, you know, you, if, you, if, you got a, <laughs> if you got sin in your life, man, well, just forget it. And so what he does, on this side of the fence, he tempts us to sin. And then when we sin, on that side of the fence, he jumps over and starts accusing us of our sins. And, oh, pff, you can't go to God now. You big blow it, you big loser. And we, we're like, oh, yeah, you're right, I can. No, no. see, God's promise is, I'm not, I'm not going to remember your sins anymore. Now, that's not a license to live any way you want. The Bible says that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. That when you understand that your sin deserves death, somebody's got to die for your sin. The Bible says all of sin falls short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. The Bible says God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we're yet sinners, Christ 
died for us. So when you understand that your sin necessitated Jesus Christ dying on the cross, well, if you truly understand that and if you truly respond to that by saying, God, I, I recognize that I, there's no do good, try harder. It's not like I can earn a right standing with you. But the only way that I can be forgiven is to say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Have mercy on me, Lord. Forgive me. Thank you for that gift of forgiveness. I receive that gift of forgiveness. And then what should happen if that such of an encounter takes place? Well, then the, the natural response response to God in terms of how you live your life is not, oh, I got to get out of jail free card so I can live any way I want. No, what it's his kindness that leads you to repentance. You live a, such a life that says, man, my sin is so horrible that it necessitated Jesus' death. And what does that do? It causes us to repent of our sins, to grieve over our sins, to mourn our sin. So when we sin, it's just a place for us to further to just drive back to God and say, have mercy on me, God, forgive me, and so on. And so Satan tries to throw this thing into our face, but we need to understand, no, truly, the, the forgiven in Christ, God chooses to re remember your sins no more. But the unrepentant have the opposite promise. God remembers their iniquities. See, for us to understand God's judgment, that the Bible speaks of the day of judgment, right? It's appointed unto man once to die, the Bible says, and then to face judgment. Every last one of us is going to face judgment. Question is where? How? So, so for those that live their life in such a way that they say, well, okay, I'm going to stand before God, I believe in heaven, I believe in hell, so I'm going to stand before God, so I'm going to be religious, and I'm going to earn a right standing with God through my religion. Well, that's not trusting in Christ. That's trusting in you. And so if that's the way you live your life, never surrendering to Christ, never truly receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, but rather trusting in your religious performance, well, you'll be judged at a place called the Great White Throne Judgment. And what will happen there is you will be judged according to your works. Or... You reject God outright. You say, there is no heaven, there is no hell. All we got today is, all we've got is the earth today. So eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I'm just going to live however I want. Well, you will be judged by your works too. Great white throne judgment. You'll breathe your last on earth. You will go before the Lord. You will be judged according to your works. And the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. So your works will earn you eternal spiritual damnation, death. Now, there is the judgment seat of Christ, the mercy seat of Christ. That's for believers. And what happens there is this isn't a judgment for, for rescue. It's not a judgment for eternal life. It's a judgment for reward. So your works will be judged at the mercy seat of Christ, but you're not being judged for salvation. That's already been settled at the judgment seat of Christ. So the judgment seat of Christ for believers is just where God judges your works as to reward. And how, what is your reward in heaven's going to be? You're like, well, I'm already in heaven. What kind of reward are we talking about? I don't know. I mean, the Bible has this beautiful picture of the elders there worshiping the Lord in the throne room of God, and they've got these crowns that they were, that they were given, and they cast these crowns in worship of the Lord. They cast them at His feet. They have something to give to Him, even in the perfection of heaven, to worship God. So God remembers the iniquities of the unrepentant. That's our point here. And then we see there in verse 4, well, it's another voice that's coming from heaven. And this is the voice of the Lord. It says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. It's critically important here. That, that word, come out, it, in, in the Greek, it's the, it's the word exhergomai. That's, that's in the Greek. Good luck spelling it. I, I'm, I'm good enough I can even pronounce it. Exergomai is the right pronunciation of it. Here's what it means. It has a literal meaning, and it has a metaphorical meaning. The literal, literal meaning of that phrase, come out, it means literally to depart. Metaphorically, what it means is it means to forsake. And both definitions are in view here. These are, it means both, as the Lord commands it. He basically is telling these believers, look, 
depart and forsake completely Babylon. Again, hey, spiritually speaking, church has been raptured, church is up in heaven, but still tons of people coming to know the Lord and coming to a saving faith in Christ. So during this time, yes, God's final wrath is being poured out, but there's still many believers that are on the earth at this time that have come to a saving faith in God. They're called tribulation saints, and and so they're there, and God is speaking to them, and he says basically, look, I'm going to smoke Babylon. Get out. Get out of Dodge, man. I don't want you there. And notice the two reasons why. First, lest you share in her sins. And second, lest you receive her plague. Same application, by the way, for us. And this is is our money application here. This This is where we come back and camp out at the end of the message today. The big takeaway, Revelation 18, is we need to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Look, and for these two reasons, lest you share in her sins, number one, and lest you receive her plagues. Hey, the Bible says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. And, and that's what happens when you keep the wrong company. You begin picking up their bad habits and it mars your character. That's this first warning, lest you share in her sins. You hang out with the, with the wrong people, it's only a matter of time before you start doing the wrong things. And, hey, lest you receive her plagues, look, you can get to the place... To where if you hang out with the wrong crowd, you become just like them. And, hey, you share in the judgment of them is what's being said here. Understand, this is not a unique situation. We see this biblically. There was a similar warning that was given to Lot and to his family in Sodom and Gomorrah. Hey, get out. Judgment's coming. It's going to hit. Similar warning as well, Paul gave to the, to, the, to, to the Corinthian Christians in 2 Corinthians. He said this, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and We'll walk among them. I'll be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among believers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I'll welcome you. And I'll be your father and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, we're going to come back to this in a minute. But here now in our text, the sins of Babylon, they've piled up high to heaven. God remembers their sin And he says now there in verse 6, Render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has has mixed, mix double for her. Now, the idea here isn't that Babylon gets double judgment, you know, gets twice as much as she's got coming. It's it's not like, oh, you know what, you slap me on the cheek, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. Or you put one of my guys in the hospital, I'm going to put two of your guys in the morgue. It's not like you're going, to, you're going to get more than you have coming. As a matter of fact, the better translation is, hey, give her double punishment for her double sins. In other words, what's being said here is give Babylon exactly what she deserves for the multitude of her sins. And verse 7 makes that clear. We continue. It says, in the meantime... Um, or I'm sorry, in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in, here it is, the same measure, give her torment and sorrow, for she says in her heart, I sit as queen, I'm no widow and will not see sorrow. Now you'll remember when Jesus went and tempted Satan in the wilderness that basically he tempted him with with these these three things the lust of the world and the lust of the flesh and the or, and the and the the lust of the eyes right and the 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 I'm sorry the lust of the flesh the lust of the of the eyes and the pride of life this was what he tempted the the world with and this is what John says in 1 John he says for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes the pride of life it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And that's what we see here in verse 7. Basically, he says, look, I'm going to judge this, this nation of Babylon. Uh, 
she, she glorified herself. She lived luxuriously. Um, and uh, she says in her heart, look, I see this queen. I'm no widow, and I will not see sorrow. So, you know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, alive and well in Babylon. God says, look, she's, she's, she's got it coming to her. I'm going to judge her. And so the judgments are now executed. Verse 8, therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine, <coughs> she'll be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. We're going to see the Lord's judgment poured out here. We're going to see a few things repeated often. We're going to see that it emphasizes that the judgment happens in one hour. This place is completely destroyed. We're going to see that it's so horrific that nobody wants nothing to do with it. They stand at a distance. They won't even come near, won't even think to like, well, can we go help anybody? No, we're not going to do that. There's fire. There's torment. There's weeping. There's, there's gnashing of teeth. It's a horrible scene. Verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment. Does that mean that this is nuclear, you know, nuclear explosion and this whole standing of, at a distance and so on? Who knows? Could be, could be fire and brimstone. We don't know. But they're standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. For no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of, now get the, the these are the high-end things that we're talking about here. Merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, and every kind of object of uh, most precious wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, incense, fragrant oil, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, and chariots, and this last part is interesting, and bodies and souls of men. All these high-end merchandise, and all of a sudden the bodies and souls of men are lumped in there. Does this mean people are being bought and sold like possessions? Well, yeah, and, and really, people are being bought and sold like possessions in our day and age, in our economy, in our fallen world. We're not just talking about slavery, we're talking about people who sell their souls, for a crust of bread, people in the sex traffic industry, people, you know, selling their bodies for, for drugs, for alcohol, for whatever it is. And he says in verse 14, the, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. And the emphasis there is they, they are not to be found. They are just not existent. Like, all of these things are gone, baby. They are gone. They ain't coming back. And, and what comes to my mind is the scripture that says, what is a profit of man if he gains the whole world and forfeits its, his soul? What will he give in, in exchange for his soul? And there's a lot of things we trade things of great value for. We sell our soul for a crust of bread. We have this attitude that permeates within the church, that, that kind of this attitude that says, well, gosh, how, how close can I get to the edge? How, how, how much can I be in the world but not be of the world? Totally wrong focus. Completely wrong focus. When, when I met my wife, my focus wasn't, oh, gosh, look at everything I got to give up. Look at all these chicks that I got to give up. To date this guy, I was like, none, none of that mattered. It wasn't, you know, and, and, and what the emphasis here is the idea of, look, the Lord says, separate yourself and utterly forsake yourself from Babylon. Get out. And when I, when I found my wife, it wasn't like I was saying, oh, look at all this, 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 these people, these, this stuff that I got to give up for my wife. Wrong attitude, wrong focus. It was, look at what I'm getting. Christian, do you remember what you got in Jesus Christ? What you gave up? I mean, please, are you serious? 
And what did you give up? You gave up drugs. You gave up alcohol. You gave up a guilty conscience. You gave up shame. You gave up death and destruction and no hope. You gave all of that up for Jesus Christ. So it's not a matter of how close to the edge can I get. No, wrong focus, baby. It's about this seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The fruit you so long for has gone from you. All the things which are, uh, which are rich and splendid have gone from you. And, there, and, and, and you shall find them no more at all. The, the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance of fear of her to- torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city which was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many trade on, on uh, the sea stood at a distance and smoke, or and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she's made desolate. Death, destruction, loss, the whole scene there. And now in verse 20, the scene completely shifts. Now the focus is on heaven. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Now, what's in view here in verse 20 is, is, is a different valuation. We just went through saw all the valuation of those who have completely forsaken the Lord, trusting in all the things of the world, and so their lament is all the stuff they've lost. The rejoicing here is those who have a different valuation, the valuation of heaven. And what's not being said here in verse 20 is, hey, God's exhorting us to rejoice over the death of the wicked. That is not the rejoicing here that is in view. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11 says that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Why? Well, because we've covered that. God loves you. He loves mankind. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you with an, with an unending love. So he's not, he's not rejoicing because wicked men have perished here. No, what he's rejoicing in the exhortation to rejoice is the attitude of the restoration of righteousness. Rejoice in the fact that this world that's been fallen since the creation, God created it in the Garden of Eden to be this God-glorifying thing, and Satan hijacked it, and he's taken captive men and women to do his will for centuries and centuries and, and, and thousands of years. And now rejoice because, hey, listen, that's getting all done with, and God is setting up here for the return of the bride, his church, for setting up of his millennial reign. On the earth, verse 21, then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No more music. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. No more workers, no work to be had. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. No more food. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you any more. No more power over the darkness. And the voice of a bride and a bridegroom and a bride shall not be heard in you any more. No more weddings. Here's the idea. Look, it's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of everything that we call normal. It is all done. He says, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, and for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. In other words, the Lord says, look, it's all you're doing. Your great men did this. It's your sin. So we see in these verses the destruction of the political and economic Babylon. And this is the, the destruction. It's going to p- impact everybody on earth. It's going to, the, the kings, they're lamenting the destruction of their precious political system. The merchants, the shipmasters, they're lamenting the loss of their profits. Curiously, nobody's mentioning the great loss of life. All they care about is their stuff's all gone. 
And we speculate, you know, what is this? Is this, is this nuclear warfare, this thing that consumes it all in one hour? That people are so afraid to draw near that they stand off at a great distance and watch the, the flames? Maybe, maybe, as I said, what we're seeing here is just like Sodom and Gomorrah, the raining down of fire from heaven. Interestingly, speaking of Sodom and Gomorrah, look at the very last verse here. It says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. Now, this is a post-mortem on Babylon. Babylon has now been destroyed, and somebody's gone through and checked it all out, and they say, oh, look at this. What we have here is the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who are slain on the earth. And there's a couple ways to look at this. One, you could say, look, they got blood on their hands. They, they shed the blood of the prophets and the saints, and so now what you've got there is you've got their blood. God required their blood of them, and now they've all been destroyed, the wicked, in Babylon. Or you could look at it this way. Well, God gave this warning to say, get out of there. And just like happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, with Lot's wife, you've got someone who, well, she didn't want to go. She went, she looked back. Why? Well, because she was more in love with Sodom and Gomorrah than she was in the Lord. And so is it possible, are we reading here in verse 24, that God has given this warning and some of the, some of the saints didn't bail like they, they were supposed to? I don't know, but here's the take home, and here's where we take a walk with this for ourselves. The big application for me as I read Revelation 18, for us as we hear it, for us today, because yeah, this is the stuff talking about the great tribulation. This is how God's going to deal with Babylon. This is what's going to happen to them. But this message of, hey, come out from among them and be separate, this preaches to every last one of us here. And let me just say it this way. If Christianity were a crime, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict? I have a friend who, for 30 years, worked in the same place. And when he retired, at his retirement party, it came out there that he was a Christian. And one of his co-workers, who he'd worked with for 30 years, said to him, Oh, you're a Christian? I'm like, dude, that's a failure right there. That's a failure when a guy you worked with for 30 years had no idea that you were a Christian. And, and for us, we have to understand, yes, we're in the world, but we're not to, to be of the world. There's this, there's this great trend right now amongst church planters, and you get these, you get these guys, and, and they think, oh, it's totally in vogue. Like, what we're going to do is we're going to go, we're going to have a Bible study down, down at the pub. We're all going to drink beer, and we're going to do a Bible study down there. And, and, and there, there's just sort of this attitude that's like, oh, we're going to become relevant to the people that were around. You know, Jesus was a friend of wine bibbers and so on, and so we're going to become relevant in that way. And, and I just, I'm like... I love the way Pastor Joe Foch put it out of Philadelphia. He's like, God delivered me from drugs and alcohol. Why on earth would I ever go back to it? Because God delivered me from that. And listen, I I feel the same way. When When I started my first church in Menifee, I was working at the fire department. And, and I wanted desperately to get out of the fire department. It had been my lifelong dream to be in the fire department. Guys would slit their mom's throat for my job, you know, kind of thing. And, and I'm like, yeah, well, some of the guys I worked with might have done that. And, and it's like, I just, I wanted it desperately, and now I just wanted to be in the ministry full time, and God wasn't making it happen. And I'm like talking to God going, you know, God, this isn't hard for you. Like, you own all the money everywhere. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. Like, there's nothing for you to come up with some dough for me to be able to make my living full-time in the church. But man, God, in his, in his wisdom, he just left me there for a period of time to where we couldn't afford to bring me on staff. So I got the church going, and I'm working. Well, what God did while I was there at the fire department, among other things, was, as I'm sharing my faith with these guys, I'm sharing my faith with a guy named Roger. And Roger, unsaved, but... But man, he would listen to me, and he would come to me for, for, for counsel and advice. So I invited him to come to church. So he's coming to our church. And, um, and every Sunday, the message is preached, and I'd go up to him afterwards, and I'd say, Roger, are you ready to give your life to Jesus? And he's like, no, man, I'm not. All right. But he kept coming back. 
So one day, we've, we've got, we, we got a field that we want to build on, and it's overgrown with, with weeds. And ironically, we got a notice from the fire department saying we had to cut the weeds all down. So I go to Roger. I go, hey, dude, you got a tractor. Can you take care of this for us? And he goes, yeah, sure. So he comes down, you know, trailers his tractor down. He lives in Hemet, comes over. Working on the field, I pick him up lunch. I'm going to bring him lunch. So I, so I grab some lunch. I go down to the field. It's August. I come rolling up. I'm in, I'm in a, a, a car that my single mother, sister-in-law gave to me. You know it's bad and pathetic for you when you're driving a hand-me-down from a single mom, okay? So I come rolling up in this car. I got no air conditioning. It's August, right? I'm beet red. And there is Roger, and he's sitting on the seat or on the, the, the wheel of his tractor, Flat tire. Dude, you got a flat. Yeah, but I got a spare at my house. Can you give me a ride? Sure. So he hops in the car. We start heading down to his house. Well, not only am I driving a jalopy with no air conditioning, but I got no gas either. We promptly run out of gas. We're in Winchester down, you know, on the road there on our way into Hemet. And here's how the scene goes. I start the car. I put it in drive. We drive about 30 feet. It dies. I stick it in neutral. We coast, and then we come to a stop. I put it in park, turn off the key. We sit and talk a while. I'm sweating like Mike Tyson in a spelling bee, man. It's just like, just, and so we're there. So finally, we get to Hammett. We get back, and we, we're, we're back to put the, the wheel on to get back to work. Roger won't get out of the car. He looks at me, and he goes, Ted. I just want what you've got. Now, I take inventory the last two hours. I'm like, what on earth do I have that you could possibly want? He said, you got joy. You got peace. You're happy. Just look at you, man. You're just happy. He goes, I want that. I go, Roger, dude, the only thing I've got that you need is Jesus. He kneels down in the dirt and receives Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior on the spot. Now listen, I didn't lead Roger to Jesus by going and hanging out with him in some bar. I was able to lead Roger to Jesus because I had come out from that whole scene and I just love Jesus, man. I just want to walk with him. And listen, God wants to do the same with you. And some of you today, you know that God is telling you, get out from where you're at right now. You're keeping company you shouldn't keep. You're hanging out with people you shouldn't be hanging out with. Listen, there's not enough difference in the way that you live your life right now. Gosh, you, you know that you've given your life to me. Why don't you start living like it for crying out loud? Maybe the Lord would say that to some of us today. Maybe today the Lord might say to you, hey, I'm calling you to surrender your life to me. Maybe you've been living your life in such a way. Look, let me just ask you the question. If you got hit by a bus today on the way home, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Because Jesus loves you and he gave his life for you. And he extends to you today the invitation to receive him as Lord and Savior. To know that when you die, your sins are forgiven. You can spend eternity with him. 